Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I hope we, uh, I hope I'm able to answer some questions today, and um, hopefully we'll we'll be able to provide you some good information with this presentation. So with that, we'll get started. Um, to begin with, I'm going to cover our agenda here, and we're going to talk about ventilation requirements for embryo development. Obviously, the uh, the importance of ventilation is is for that purpose. Uh, also, understanding consistency in fresh air conditions. And then I'm gonna kind of jump to a topic I call the big three. Uh, when we're dealing with transitions in season, uh, these are the, gonna be the, the three big topics that I feel like make the biggest impact at the hatchery level in order to uh, get prepared for that change. So in when we talk about ventilation requirements for embryo development, you know, the quality of the hatching, hatchling will depend largely on how the embryo is able to utilize the nutrients that are provided within the egg. Uh, you know, as the, as the embryo develops, um, it consumes oxygen. You can see here in the picture, and then we have a release of carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide and then a water vapor. When we look at the requirements for that embryo to develop, you know, it's a relatively short list course it can be complicated and we're going to cover these topics with uh, in the beginning but we're looking at temperature humidity turning oxygen and co2 so with temperature and i've got a graph here that you can see um, but with temperature we know that in the beginning it is endothermic and then in the end, it's exothermic, which means the embryo requires a higher air temperature in the beginning and a lower air temperature in the end. So temperature becomes a function that requires control, adding heat in the beginning and removing heat in the end. And we can see by our, by our chart here, when we look at uh, CO2 production that follows our oxygen consumption and then the heat that's produced as the embryo grows. When we look at humidity, you know, external humidity meaning the amount of humidity in an incubator, um, it affects the internal moisture. And so as the embryo develops and becomes exothermic, this causes an increase in the moisture loss from the egg. So increased internal moisture loss creates the higher levels of moisture in the machine and therefore it becomes a function of control. When you do a quick calculation on that. We look at a incubator that holds a single stage machine that holds up to 126,000 eggs and they average a 65 gram and 11% moisture loss over 18 days. That's a total of 899 liters or 237 grams of moisture that will be removed from that egg mass in that machine. So it kind of puts things in perspective when you look at the volume of of moisture. Of course, turning, um, you know, we're not going to get too detailed with this, but it is required to keep the yolk from settling through the albumin and attaching itself to the shell wall. Again, this becomes a function of control and it improves airflow around the egg. Um, a lot of, a lot of times we don't think about that from a ventilation perspective, um, but it does affect the process and we'll learn more about that as, as we go through the presentation. Next, we look at oxygen. So oxygen is really considered and is a vital nutrient to feed the embryo as it develops. So oxygen consumption begins with the development of the vascular system, which is very early in embryonic development. And then consumption increases proportionally as the embryonic development advances. And as that embryo consumes oxygen, it produces CO2. And you can again see that in the in the chart there on the right side of the screen. So with CO2 production, as it increases proportionally with the embryo development, uh, we also recognize that CO2 exposure at specific times and specific levels enhances embryonic development. So again, CO2 becomes a function of control. So when we look at the incubation equipment that is in the industry today, the whether it be multi-stage or, or single stage or our James Way product line or our Chickmaster product line, 
we recognize that the machine is capable of controlling the temperature, humidity, and the turning, but what about the oxygen? Well, in pretty much all cases, we build a machine that's designed to handle the temp, humidity, and turning, but the vital nutrient is provided to the embryo by airflow through the machine that is supplied from the hatchery ventilation system. So that's the importance of, of our ventilation. Your ventilation system should be operated to provide consistency in temperature, humidity, fresh air volume, all while being clean and free of contaminants. In addition to providing the vital nutrient, ventilation through the machine also provides cooling in the form of embryonic heat absorption as it passes through the machine. So when we design machines, we design with that particular concept in mind. We understand that we have to have the airflow for oxygen and therefore that cooling uh, that occurs is also a part of the design of that machine. In addition, that volume of air removes excessive moisture that allows us to get rid of all, all that humidity that we talked about earlier that's produced as the embryos uh, develop. It also depletes CO2. Uh, remember, we can't really remove CO2 out of the air. We essentially deplete it by exchanging air through the machine. And with that air exchange, it helps minimize airborne contaminants. So <clears throat> having, um, as we've stated here, having the correct volume of fresh air at the right temperature and the right humidity allows the machine to function properly and all of these other uh, pieces are accomplished as that process occurs. So the level of hatch performance and chick, poult, or duckling quality is directly connected to the consistency of the environment in which it is incubated. So anytime the condition of the fresh air being supplied by the ventilation system is too hot, too cold, too humid, too dry or not the correct volume, the incubation environment will be sacrificed. So when we look at an incubation environment, we can break it down pretty simply in looking at the fact that we're really just trying to manage temperature, humidity, and pressure. So when we get to the seasonal changes that in many parts of the world right now we're going through, here are my, my big three that I look at. I look at equipment preparation, and we're gonna discuss that portion first, and then we'll talk about humidity and temperature control. So I think a lot of times with equipment preparation, um, we think about normal maintenance routine and then you know day-to-day -day maintenance, week to week, month to month. I always try to remind people that anytime we deal with a seasonal change that's an extreme, such as in the United States right now, we're, we're preparing ourselves for, for the extreme winter condition. And in the, sun, in the Southern hemispheres, we're, we're dealing with facilities that are preparing for uh, the summer conditions. And so anytime you prepare for a seasonal change when it's an extreme, the first thing we have to think about is, is our equipment prepared for that seasonal change? So we're gonna discuss air filtration, belts, pulleys, and this is specific to HVAC units. And we're also gonna talk about main blower, uh, compressors, evaporative coils, condenser coil, uh, condenser fans, the gas heating capabilities of the equipment, uh, combustion blowers, gas regulators, uh, pressure on the fresh air intake dampers, and then of course cabinet access doors on equipment. So let's go through some of those details. When I talk about belts and pulleys, I talk about condition, tension, and alignment. So I want to make sure if I have that big seasonal adjustment, it's usually pretty convenient to make sure that I've got enough belts on hand that I look at that as an opportunity to maybe it's time that we change those belts and get prepared for the season. So when we, there we go. For some reason my, my clicker wasn't working. Anyway, we talk about condition. We wanna to try to avoid dry and cracked belts 
uh, they should be replaced. Grooved or worn pulleys should be replaced to avoid belt damage. Tension obviously should be just tight enough to avoid slippage or squealing during blower startup. If we put that, uh, if we put it on there too tight, we'll have an over amperage on our motor. And then oftentimes we damage the belt by getting it on there too tight. And now it stretches and it causes the cracking. So make sure that, uh, that you get your belt tension correct. And then when we look at alignment, what I mean by that is that the, the drive pulley from the motor and the receiving pulley uh, on the blower should be in perfect alignment with each other. Uh, you can see that in this illustration where this technician is using a straight edge across the two faces of the pulleys. And this is just to make sure that the belt uh, rolls around both pulleys without creating a, a side tension, which is gonna cause excessive wear and, and shorten the life of the, of, the, of the belt. We talk about main blower condition and sanitation. From a condition perspective, it's very good to make sure that you do a visual check on the blower uh, and make sure that it's not warped or doesn't have any damaged uh, fins because either one of these uh, occurrences can cause a, a reduction in air movement. When we look at sanitation, uh, seasonally, these blowers should be cleaned uh, because of the movement of the blower it creates a, a static and it will attract uh, dirt and debris. You'll see buildup of, of that on the leading edge of the, of the blower. And again, it just reduces the blower's ability to move air. Also, you'll see on the underside of, of the fins in a, in a blower, uh, you'll oftentimes have mold growth or you'll have some, some dirt buildup in, in there as well. So it's always important to make sure these blowers are, are clean and prepared for, for your extreme season that, that's approaching. In addition to that, with HVAC units, uh, they have a refrigeration circuit. We're talking about compressors, coils, and condenser fans. Compressors. We wanna make sure that refrigerant pressure should be checked annually. And so for locations that are approaching summer, uh, dealing with the heat, we wanna make sure that that, that circuit is, is correct and it's, it has the right refrigerant level. When we look at evaporative coils and condenser coils, it's pretty obvious in this particular picture that I've shown here, uh, the coil in se itself is, is pretty dirty. So we wanna make sure that the coils are cleaned and are prepped and are, are uh, gonna be capable of absorbing the right amount of, of energy as, as the uh, refrigerant circuit operates. Make sure you use a foaming non-acid coil cleaner. Uh, all too often I've visited hatcheries that have ventilation equipment that's only a few years old and you'll see a coil that is has been damaged by an acid type cleaner uh, wasn't rinsed thoroughly. And unfortunately that uh, greatly reduces the efficiency of that coil. So you lose a lot of your cooling capacity just because you, you didn't use the right cleaning uh, solution for that. After cleaning a fin comb should be used to just make sure that all of, uh, all of the fins are good and straight. When we talk about condenser fans, um, on a condenser coil, the condition of these fans are essentially trying to draw atmospheric air through that condenser coil so the refrigerant can condense. It's got to remove that heat. And these condenser fans uh, are generally always mounted on top of the unit. And if you have units that are uh, beside the building or in a location, it's, it's fairly easy for debris to find its way into these condenser fans and, and cause some damage. So make sure those are checked and uh, are in good condition. So let's talk a little bit about the gas train, the heating capacity. So if I'm in a seasonal adjustment where I'm going into a cold climate, I wanna make sure that my, my gas heating capability is, is gonna work well. And there's a lot to it. Obviously it begins with an igniter and a pilot uh, electronic igniters and pilots should be cleaned annually. 
um, in most pilot systems, there's a, you've got a sensor there that proves the pilot is on. And if that sensor is not clean, then the ignition of the combustion blower or the combustion won't be allowed to complete its cycle. So it's important that that get cleaned. The heat exchanger itself should be externally and internally uh, clean, generally just with compressed air. And you wanna make a visual check of that to make sure you don't have any heat cracks. Because if you have a, if you have a heat crack or any type of damage to that heat exchanger, the combustion of the gas then is allowed to uh, essentially put carbon monoxide into the airstream, and then that's gonna be provided into the hatchery uh, with the fresh air. So make sure you do a visual inspection of these heat exchangers to make sure they're, they don't have any damage. Uh, the combustion blower should be removed and cleaned uh, to ensure adequate airflow for proper gas combustion. Again, it's another little blower. It can collect dirt and debris. And if it's not in good physical condition, uh, you won't have adequate airflow through the heat exchanger. And without the airflow, you won't have good gas combustion. And all of a sudden I lose heating capacity. So I may have a unit designed to operate at 300,000 BTU and I may lose as much as 30 or 40% of my capacity if that combustion blower is just not moving adequate airflow. And then we look at a gas pressure regulator. So most systems today have a high pressure natural gas or they'll have a low pressure propane uh, gas system. And in both cases, the unit itself is designed to only operate at a specific pressure. So it'll have a gas pressure regulator that by design has to be set to a specific pressure. And it's good uh, as you near the extreme winter conditions or cold time of the year, it's, uh, it's a great idea to make sure that you check that gas pressure again to make sure that you have a unit that's operating at its designed heating capacity. Because if the pressure's wrong, it, it won't function correctly. And this is an image of a typical, uh, this is one, I believe this is an image from an Aon unit. It is a stainless steel tube uh, heat exchanger. On the right hand side of it, you can see the combustion blower and the, and the main gas train. This is a little bit better image. And here I can point out, I hope you could see my mouse on the screen, but this is our gas line that comes into the unit. Here's our main gas valve. It also has a, a, a small bypass for a pilot. So it'll send a little bit of gas to the, to the main combustion uh, heat exchanger. So it can light the, the ignition. And then it's got a secondary stage that will kick on then and you get full combustion as long as everything works correctly. Here's our, our igniter and this, uh, our, our ignition tube comes down to that combustion chamber. And then here's our combustion blower. Uh, you'll note that I mentioned earlier, you have to remove this because you visually can't see it without undoing a couple of bolts and pulling this out of, of the unit. Um, but that essentially the combustion blower doesn't do anything but draw fresh atmosphere air through this as ignition occurs and allows complete combustion of the, of the flow of gas into the unit. So this gives you a really good, good view um, of a specific unit, but pretty much all gas-fired rooftop heating units have the same basic principle. Gas line, gas valve, combustion blowers, and then your main heat exchanger that, that is inside of the unit. In addition to that, uh, fresh air intake dampers and access doors is also another, another thing that really deserves good inspection when we come into the season. We look at fixed position outside air intake dampers, generally are on units that are used for egg rooms, oftentimes chick rooms, corridors, um, you know, areas where pressure control is not required, but fresh outside air is. Um, it's a good idea to make sure that you inspect those fresh air intake dampers, make sure they're cleaned and they're in the correct position. 
I'll visit hatcheries a lot of times and especially in the summer and high humidity conditions and egg rooms exist and you'll go to the roof and look at the um, outside air intake damper on those units and even though they're fixed someone has moved them to a closed position and they've done that probably to to try to help maintain the environment a little bit better in the in the room so it's a good idea seasonally to always check those uh, intake dampers that are modulating now they modulate specifically because it is trying to control room pressure you know you have a pressure sensor in the room it references to atmosphere generally and then the damper modulates more open to bring in a higher volume of fresh air in order to meet the desired room pressure setting. So you'll see, uh, uh, this is an example of an outside air intake damper. Uh, the bottom part of the damper, which in this image where it's open, uh, generally this connects to a return duct from the room. And in this case, it may be an incubator room or it may be a hatcher room. Uh, but this uh, room air then is returned up and comes through that set of dampers. And then the ones on the top will connect to an outside air hood. And so this motor will modulate and you see the linkage. And this allows a combination of return air room and fresh outside air room or fresh outside air to come into the HVAC unit and mix uh, prior to going through a set of filters and then generally a, a cooling coil. So it's very important this time of year and you get into seasonal changes, it's extremely critical that these actuators get checked. Uh, you check the dampers, make sure they're calibrated, make sure they physically operate and they function the way that they should. And then we look at cabinet and access doors. It's pretty common to go to a hatchery and visit and go on a roof and you're doing an inspection of the ventilation and you find that a lot of the outside air uh, cabinet doors are cracked open or they don't have seals or they're not latched closed. So use that seasonal uh, change as a, a requirement to physically check those types of things as well. When we look at air handling units, so this is a picture of, a, of an airway system. This is a modular airway system that, that we've provided to a customer. Uh, but it's, it's a relatively common when we talk about air handling units. And the difference between an air handling unit and say what we refer to as a rooftop HVAC unit is that an air handling unit will have generally a chilled water coil for cooling and a hot water coil for heating. And so the unit itself really doesn't do anything but handle air. The ability to cool and heat comes when we connect this unit to ancillary equipment, uh, such as water chillers and, and water heaters or water boilers. And so with air handling units, we still have air filtration that's important and, and critical. Uh, we still have the belts and pulleys. We still have the main blower uh, condition and sanitation. So don't forget those pieces around an air handling unit. But we'll, with, uh, with this section of equipment preparation, we're going to talk about maintaining those heating and cooling coils, uh, fresh air supply dampers, and then supporting ancillary equipment, chillers, boilers, and the hot water heating, and then, of course, pumps, uh, both process and recirculation. So when we jump into our heating and cooling coils, you'll notice I also mentioned strainers and modulating valves because with uh, chilled water or hot water flow, uh, normally that flow is regulated and the cooling or heating capacity is regulated by a modulating valve, which makes it different than a, say a compressor on an HVAC unit. So with heating and cooling coils, again, it's important to make sure that those are cleaned uh, again, use the foaming non-acid coil cleaner. And then after cleaning, make sure that the fins are straight. What's different with having chilled water and hot water flow through coils is that generally on those coils, you're gonna have a water strainer. 
and it's generally going to be a Y strainer uh, like this image here that I'm showing. If you pull this cap off of this Y strainer, uh, you'll see a screen of some sort that actually, uh, you know, slides right into that chamber. And so all the water that enters that, that coil, whether it be chilled water or hot water, has to go through a screen or a strainer. And so a seasonal change is a, a very strong reminder that these strainers should be removed and, and thoroughly cleaned uh, to make sure that we don't restrict water flow. Uh, because with heating or cooling, the volume of flow through the coil is what uh, determines your BTU capacity or your heating or cooling capacity. And uh, we'll lose efficiency anytime or we'll lose capacity anytime we have flow restrictions. So it's very important that you pay attention to your to the strainers on a air handling unit with chilled and hot water. We talk about modulating hot chilled water valves. In this case, uh, you would have an example. This is an example of one of those types of valves. Uh, it's kind of a two part. You have the valve body itself, and then you have an actuator. And the actuator is what the electric actuator is what um, controls flow rate uh, from a zero to 100%. And so in any system where you have modulating control on that flow, it's very critical uh, to make sure that those are calibrated where zero is zero uh, and 100% gives you full flow. Um, I think it's important to mention that because oftentimes I'll visit a facility and I'll find uh, a unit that is not operating at full cooling capacity. And I'll find that the actuator on the hot water valve is out of calibration. And so we're still allowing five to 10% of hot water flow through the hot water coil. And we're losing cooling capacity when we do that. So it's very important to make sure that these are calibrated and checked. Uh, modulating fresh air supply dampers, generally with air handling units, you'll have, uh, if it's a 100% fresh air system, you'll have a variable speed blower, but oftentimes in the supply duct going into the facility, this air handler may supply multiple rooms. Uh, we see that in the case of having a CC3 or a central ventilation system. Uh, but anytime you have these air handlers, oftentimes you can, you can have multiple rooms. So the modulating fresh air damper typically is built into the duct. And as you can see here, this damper is, is internal to this duct. And so it's very important to make sure that these are accessed, visually inspected, make sure they're clean, not damaged, uh, and make sure they're functioning properly. In addition to that, you'll have an externally duct mounted actuator, a motor again, like the, like the, the modulating water valves, uh, it's designed to have full operating range of zero to 100%. Uh, and it's important to make sure that these are calibrated and are, and are functioning properly. So when we look at ancillary equipment, what supports the air handling equipment, um, seasonal checks around chillers become something that uh, oftentimes we overlook. A lot of air handling systems utilize a chiller that is specific to the conditioning of air. It doesn't supply cold water to incubation equipment, it just simply provides chilled water to the uh, air handling units. So we look at a chiller like this, we have compressors, condenser coils, condenser fans, evaporative heat exchangers. Uh, we concern ourselves about water quality, uh, pumps and piping systems. So when we look at a modular air handling system like this, you can see in the image where here are your air handlers. And then here's our supporting ancillary equipment. We have a chiller here, uh, also water heaters, uh, pumps that will recirculate that water through the coils in these air handling units. So when we look at chillers, the refrigeration circuit again is very critical. Oftentimes chillers are 
on the ground, uh, making it easier for uh, debris to find its way into the condensing coils, uh, also debris into the uh, condensing fans. So when we talk about compressors, refrigerant pressures, one thing I wanna point out is, let's say you're in the United States or you're in a Northern hemisphere where you're entering winter, you think, well, I'm probably not gonna need that chiller anymore. Well, because you're not needing it, this is the perfect time of the year to go ahead and make some of these checks and changes and improvements to that chiller. Because if you find something damaged or a component that needs to be replaced, it's easier to do that now in a season where you don't, you don't uh, necessarily need it operating. Uh, also with chillers that work for HVAC systems, they'll have a crankcase heater on them. It's important to make sure that those are drawing the right amperage and that those are working. You don't want your chiller to cold start without, without crankcase heaters. Again, condenser coil, um, you know, they, it's important that they're clean, but again, because it's a chiller at ground level, it's easier for debris such as leaves and, and uh, you know, trash and things of that nature to get drawn into them. And then um, when we move forward with the chiller, the chiller works with a heat exchanger. And the way this is, a typical air-cooled water chiller utilizes generally a shell and tube heat exchanger to allow the refrigerant to cool the water. Um, this is just a, a picture of a typical, uh, what's referred to as a shell and tube heat exchanger. Uh, you'll see the, the tubes inside of this, and then this is the outer shell. So that's why it's referred to as shell and tube. The water flows through the small tubes inside and the refrigerant is exposed to the tubing on the, on the outside. The reason it's important to mention this again, if I have an issue with my heat exchanger, I wanna make sure I get that taken care of during the season when I can shut it down and I don't have to worry about being without it. So even though you may be entering uh, winter and you need heat, uh, you want to be able to do that repair off season. And, or, and way to check that on a chiller is we look at pressure differential uh, on the water flow through a shell and tube heat exchanger. And if, uh, if our pressure drop is too great uh, across that, it's generally an indicator that our, we have some restrictions and some buildup. If it is required to be cleaned, generally you, you have to use a rifled brush uh, to you know, to run through the tube in order to remove the debris. Uh, a lot of times the water quality uh, is unfortunately the contributing factor to if a shell and tube heat exchanger uh, needs to be cleaned. Uh, the use of a professional chemical company, uh, you know, is generally recommended in order to make sure that our water quality is in good condition. All too often we find ourselves in hatcheries that are in a region where uh, they don't have to worry about extreme cold. And so therefore there is no water treatment in some cases. And so with that, you'll find some of the uh, generally fine chillers that the water quality is, is really very bad. If you pull the, the end, if you have this bad water and you pull the end off of, off of this shell and tube heat exchanger, oftentimes this is, this is the image you find. Um, a lot of debris, a lot of, of stuff that's in the water, and water can't flow through these little tubes any longer. And so we've lost a lot of our efficiency with our, with our cooling, and we've lost a lot of capacity. So we're wasting energy, and we're not man managing our, our room conditions when that's the case. So let's talk about water heaters. Um, you may have a system where you have multiple small uh, water heaters, or you may have a, 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 a boiler room where you have a couple of larger hot water heaters. Um, in either case, again, you have the same thing we talked about with the HVAC. Uh, you've got the igniters and pilots, the heat exchanger, combustion blower that should be removed and cleaned. 
and again, the gas pressure regulator um, that has to be checked for the pressure in order for that to, to provide you with uh, the designed heating capacity of the unit. So it's important, uh, again, with, with these units in order to provide the capacity you need to make sure you check these items on your, on your hot water heaters and your boilers. We look at pumps and piping system with an air handling uh, system. You know, it's important that we understand that uh, our heating and cooling capacity is so affected by the system's ability to move water, to move, uh, have proper flow rate and proper pressures, uh, because that's, that's what controls the capacity in a coil is the temperature of the water and the flow rate. Those two factors together is what determines how, how much capacity is in either that heating or cooling coil. So it's important when we look at a system like this to look at the gauges for proper operation. In most systems, you're going to have design criteria that says my supply water is supposed to operate at 45 PSI and my return pressure should be at 15 PSI. Well, that's creating a differential pressure on that system of 30 PSI. If I've got an issue with a pump or if I have an issue with a piping system, I'm not gonna be able to maintain that differential. In addition to that, um, just like we talked about on the coils, a lot of pumps right, built right into the pump system as you'll see, they'll have water strainers on the pumps. Uh, it's important to make sure you seasonally pull those strainers out of those pumps and clean those. Um, if you have chilled water systems that are in extremely cold climates, a lot of times they'll, they'll have trace heat tape on that piping system, and it may be on your water lines going to your chiller. Uh, it's important to check that for proper operation to make sure you don't freeze up, freeze up your water lines. And then, of course, piping insulation itself, and you can see in this illustration where everything is insulated, uh, it's really in place for a couple of reasons. One, the, the obvious, what most people consider is to avoid heat loss or gain. And two, the one that we oftentimes overlook is the fact that on chilled water systems, insulation is there as a vapor barrier. It's there to, to try to keep moisture from having exposure to the, to the pipe itself, because with that exposure, it's going to condensate and the exterior of that pipe is going to rust if it is of a material that would, uh, would allow that to do it. So uh, all too often I see chilled water systems and hatcheries that are put in with black pipe. Um, the water's not treated internally, and then externally the insulation is off in several places, and you'll find systems that are less than 10 years old that are deteriorated uh, to the point of needing to be replaced because, simply put, we didn't treat water or we didn't keep the insulation on the exterior of the pipe. So it's very critical and seasonal change to check that. So we're done with equipment preparation. We've gone through and we've made sure everything is ready to go. Um, I'm gonna talk about really what I consider probably one of the most important pieces and that's humidity. A high level of humidity in the room environment will produce undesirable conditions. High humidity conditions in incubation equipment generally causes reductions in moisture loss uh, producing navel issues, big bellies, red hocks, uh, you know, drowning chicks. And a lot of times I go to hatcheries on a visit and they don't have any moisture loss data. And so we'll spend time using a flashlight and candling some eggs at transfer just to recognize how big our air cell is uh, to help us determine at least a quick check on whether we uh, feel like we're getting adequate moisture loss or not. In single stage incubators with humidity controlled dampers, uh, they will overventilate if we have high humidity, which if we overventilate at the wrong time of incubation, it can cause cool spots in the incubator. 
uh, it also increases the requirement of fresh outside air. So you'll have higher energy costs. And then if we have a high humidity environment, it makes it easier for egg sweating to occur. Not only when we move eggs from an egg room, say to an incubator room, but also at the time of unloading eggs uh, on the egg dock. So when we, when we see that uh, egg sweating, we know we're gonna have an increased uh, rate of bacterial intrusion, higher rates of contamination, whether you refer to them as rots or exploders. And obviously it affects our hatch and chip quality when, when this is occurring. So high humidity can create a couple of, a couple of major issues. When we talk about low humidity level, it's also gonna produce undesirable conditions. Low humidity in the incubation equipment, obviously we can have excessive moisture loss, which leads to low chick yield and produces a chick that can dehydrate faster if we ever overheat them later or uh, wait too long to get them placed on, on feed and water. Uh, it also reduces the amount of available lubricant uh, to the chick and it makes it a little bit harder for them to get out of the shell um, because of the lack of moisture that's there. Excessive function of humidification in the incubators uh, can cause overcooling and produce cool spots. And then incubators with humidity control dampers will underventilate. You know, that's going to cause a reduction in our vital nutrient oxygen and it's also going to cause increased levels of CO2 and generally at a time when, when we don't need it. So also we'll have low air exchanges, which causes increased exposure to airborne contaminants. So managing humidity is a big seasonal challenge. So the two seasons that present the biggest challenges are summer and winter. You know, geographic regions that are approaching summer will be exposed to higher temperatures and higher humidity. The challenge is dealing with that high humidity. And then regions that are approaching winter will be exposed to colder temperatures and lower humidity. Now, when we talk about humidity, I, I, I can't help but try to get a little bit scientific on you. And we're gonna use a psychometric chart to kind of help explain some of those things. And I know I kind of done this intentionally, but when we look at this, this graph, there's a lot to it. It gets complicated. We have a lot of points. We have a lot of, of, of built-in, um, you know, data that can be uh, calculated by using a psychometric chart. But don't fear. I want to try to keep this simple. We're going to use a little bit of a different chart. So on this chart, I want to point out simply two things. One, across the bottom is our dry bulb temperature. And then the curved lines is the percent of relative humidity. And I've gone ahead and placed three colored dots on this chart. What I have as a green dot is our desired room set point. And in this particular case, I've chosen 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So across the bottom, I selected the 78 degrees. And then I vertically put it on a place on the chart where it's on the 50% relative humidity curve. Now, our two examples of a cold climate and a hot climate are recognized here with the blue dot. With the blue dot, I've selected 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius and 100% relative humidity. And then I've also selected a hot climate or a warm climate, and that's recognized here with the red. That's at 95 Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius, and I've put it on the same curve. It's 50% relative. So how does that have anything to do with, with what we deal with in extreme conditions? Let's start first with summer heat, high humidity climate. So I have a room set point again. I still have my green dot and we still have the red dot. And what I have to do, what I have to recognize is this represents the fresh air coming into the building. And we have to condition that air. So we're going to have to cool that air down to our desired room temperature. Again, we're back at 78 degrees. But what you recognize now is that when we look at where this falls on our chart, 
we're at 85% relative humidity. And we have a room set point of 50% relative. So we have a need to remove humidity when we have that high humidity uh, atmospheric condition. So let's look at a winter or a low humidity uh, type of season, same room temp set point. Now our fresh air that we're gonna supply into the building that we have to condition is at a temperature of 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, and it's 100% relative. So I've selected that intentionally because what happens when we heat that up, we hit our room temperature, look at where we fall on our humidity curve we end up at 18% relative humidity. So that's why we have the, the need to add humidity uh, is simply because even though it's extremely humid outside, but because it's cold, as we heat that up, we're gonna end up at 18% relative humidity. So it, it's oftentimes misunderstood when we consider uh, winter conditions, it may be very humid outside, but then we have to add so much humidity into the hatchery. So I hope that kind of clarifies how we look at a psychometric chart a little bit and, and use it to help calculate moisture adding requirements or uh, moisture removal. To take the scientific aspect of it a little farther and not to create too much confusion, I want you to recognize that what I've provided here is a water heating, you know, cooling curve with sensible latent heat energy. This is a this is simply a, a graph. This is scientific, so it's not something I've plotted or anything of that nature. But what you recognize is that in liquid form, to raise the temperature of water, this we're going to raise this temperature of water here. It, we have to add heat to raise the temperature, and then we have to remove heat to lower the temperature. This is referred to as sensible heat. In a liquid form, because we can measure that difference, it's referred to as sensible. So to raise the temperature from zero Celsius, which is here, up to 100 Celsius, or from 32 Fahrenheit up to 212 Fahrenheit, we're gonna require the use of 180 BTUs. Now keep in mind, that's only for one pound of water. So we're not talking a huge volume of water, we're talking a calculation of one pound of water. As we use this chart a little farther, once this water reaches the 100 Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit, it takes an additional 970 BTUs for one pound of water to completely turn to a gas. That's changing state. We're going from a liquid to a gas. And we refer to that as either grains of moisture or humidity as we refer to it. Uh, this is referred to as latent heat. And uh, it becomes a, a, a big reason why when we look at room humidification, so when we talk about winter low uh, humidity conditions, adding humidity at an excessive rate in an incubator causes the cool spots because of that latent heat to turn water into humidity, often referred to as evaporative cooling. This is why it highlights the importance of adding humidity in a room so we don't have to have humidification occur in the incubator itself because that's when we, we really get the cool spots. So oftentimes I get asked this question, uh, you know, at a hatchery when we look at a humidification system and someone says, hey, I'm thinking about heating the water going to my humidification system. Um, if, I, if I do that, the water will evaporate much faster and it won't create this big cooling effect when I humidify in the room. And when we look at that chart, and you recognize that there's only 180 BTUs to warm it from literally uh, zero Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit up to the point of boiling at 212 or 100 Celsius, that's only 180. Even if I heat that water all the way up to 200 degrees, 
I still have that additional 970 BTU absorption in order to turn it into a gas. So the answer to that at the end of the day is if they heat that water, not to the point of steam, but just to the point of, of hot water, they're probably gonna save yourself in the range of eight to 10%. Uh, you'll improve the rate of, of absorption. Um, sometimes it's just not, it's not necessarily worth uh, putting the effort into trying to heat, heat that water. Now, in the event that you have a steam humidification system, essentially that's what we've done with a steam system. You've added that additional 970 BTU into that pound of water. Now we can add that humidity into the room and we've eliminated that evaporative cooling effect. We've, uh, we've already added the latent heat load into that steam and therefore it, it avoids the overcooling of the room altogether. So I hope, I hope that graph kind of helps explain uh, a little bit of what happens with excessive humidification. So if you have a low humidity condition in your incubator room and you don't have an effective humidification system, a lot of times we focus on trying to lower the humidity or a wet bulb setting on the incubator uh, in a, in a, hopefully in a sense where we're trying to reduce the rate of humidification in the machine and therefore minimize the cool spots. Um, you have to take moisture loss measurements to avoid setting the humidity too low. Uh, you can obviously set the wet bulb setting on a machine low enough where you avoid spray altogether, but then your moisture loss may be excessive. So you have to have to do some moisture loss measurements in order to, to manage that. Um, if you have a humidity controlled damper on a machine, um, oftentimes it's recommended to try to to raise the minimum damper openings. And that way your machine will at least ventilate, provide the oxygen that's needed and minimize the high CO2. Again, you have to manage the moisture loss measurements uh, in order to, to not overventilate. When we look at summer or high humidity, removing the excessive humidity from the air is best accomplished with a dehumidification system. If you have a high humidity condition and don't have a dehumidif effective dehumidification system, increasing the rate of airflow through your incubators can help achieve manageable moisture loss levels. Managing the pressure differential setting on an exhaust plenum can also be helpful with increasing airflow. And again, I don't wanna get into too many specifics because it could be around uh, our platinum product line or our James Way multi-stage or Chickmaster multi-stage or our Avita product line, all of those in which require different pressure differential settings. So if you want some more details about that, uh, feel free to contact me later or we'll, we'll go through that uh, at another time. In addition for single stage incubation, uh, you can consider allowing the damper to open minimally uh, a day earlier than normal. So if I have really high humidity and I'm not getting the moisture loss I need, it may be that this may be a step you can take to try to help try to help uh, uh, remove enough moisture to have have good moisture uh, loss percentages. And again, if you have if you have those um, humidity control damper, raising the minimum damper uh, may help with that added airflow. Now the important thing to also point out. I mentioned dehumidification system. Dehumidification works just like humidification. It's the same BTU graph. The only difference is, is we're doing it in reverse. In order to dehumidify, we have to remove that heat from the air. We have to get that air temperature down to reach saturation. And we have to create an opportunity for that moisture to be removed from that air. And then we have to reheat the air so it's warm enough to you know, be provided to the room and, and meet our incubation needs. But that's how dehumidification works. It's the same as humidification, it's just in reverse. So last but not least on our big three is temperature control. I bring that up because visiting a lot of hatcheries during transitions, we see a season change and a lot of times the hatcheries aren't mindful of their desired room temperature. 
So transitions from heating to cooling and vice versa can allow the actual temperature of the room to vary greatly. While the set point may stay the same, the ventilation controller may utilize a fixed dead band or even offsets between heating and cooling. So I'm gonna provide you an example of that. So this is a controller with a one degree Fahrenheit offset between the stages of heating and cooling. And if you look at this uh, chart, what you recognize here is that the second stage heat, in this example, fresh air supply is very cold. Stage two heating will only maintain an actual temperature two degrees below set point. So as my room temp falls, my first stage heat kicks on at one degree less, and then the second stage kicks on when I get two degrees less. So if it's really cold outside, your room temperature is going to average two degrees less than what your set point is. And then the same occurs if you have a high heat application or it's in that season where you're approaching summer. If you don't adjust this set point, your room is going to average two degrees above what your desired set point is. So it's really important to change the set point to achieve the desired room temperature. So that's, you, you can, I have a time factor here across the bottom because a lot of times we'll see certain times of the year where it's warm during the day and then it's cold at night. So you'll go through the night running a cold room and then you'll go through the day with a, with a hot room. So the best you can do is, is, is hopefully try to, try to manage that where you're averaging better room temperatures. So when our fresh outside air that is brought into the hatchery is at an extreme high in the summer and cold in the winter, the cooling and heating capacity can be stressed. Uh, consistency can be lost if, if uh, we overstress it. One of the big things that I see on hatchery visits is when doors are left open on pressure control rooms. The ventilation system will attempt to bring in more fresh air to satisfy that pressure set point. The ability for the system to maintain temperature control is compromised. We've taken a unit like this and it's now operating at 100% fresh air. There's no return air. And if it's extreme heat outside, I'm probably not gonna manage the temperature correctly. Same goes with a air handling ducted 100% uh, fresh air supplied system. The damper is gonna open up more and we're gonna compromise our ability to control temperature. So during high heat temperature seasons, the room temperature will be much higher than desired, causing excessive heat during incubation. And then the same goes when it's, when it's high humidity as well, causing dehumidifications to be useless. So it's very critical that we try to manage these doors in the hatcheries in the name of trying to maintain our room conditions as best as possible. So during cold and dry season, inconsistency in room temperature can be an even bigger challenge. So when that ventilation system can't achieve room pressure, not only is the heating system stressed and the room cold, the humidification system can't achieve set point either. Because you remember from looking at our chart before, we're now supplying the room with 18% relative humidity. So the humidification system operates nonstop the latent heat demand causes the room temperature to drop even further. So it's, it's really critical when you enter these seasonal changes and extreme conditions to, to try to manage the doors. Most new hatcheries today are being constructed utilizing automatic roll-up doors um, and they, they try to avoid ever turning those off so they're, they're left open. Um, so the correct volume of fresh air at the correct temperature and humidity is so important during extreme conditions. Uh, also, you know, when we, when we look at these seasonal changes, it reminds me to always try to tell people to, to do a quick check of your pressure referencing system, uh, just to ensure that it is, is calibrated and is operating properly. Um, if, if that system's not working, again, the room is gonna try to try to provide more fresh air than necessary and, and giving us some problems. So a seasonal change should serve as that reminder. Check the outside air reference 
to make sure it is clean and the openings are, aren't blocked or clogged. A lot of times we see hatcheries with pressure issues and ventilation problems, and, and this can be a culprit of that issue. The outside reference box has, has dirt buildup in it or it's got condensation in it, and it uh, doesn't give you a good outside air reference. Same goes for any room or plenum reference box to make sure they're in good condition. And then of course the piping and tubing used to connect the reference boxes back to the control uh, room controls should also be checked to make sure they're free of moisture or debris. Uh, a lot of times we completely overlook that. You see the small quarter inch tubing that runs from a plenum to a controller and it's got a lot of sagging in that in the line. Um, and a lot of times we'll find it with water build up in that tubing and it just doesn't allow a good reference. So anything around our pressure and its inability to manage pressure correctly is just simply going to cause our system to have to, to overwork in an extreme condition. So our room temperatures are, and humidity are going to suffer. So in summary, during extreme seasons, make sure you're meeting the ventilation requirements for the embryo to develop properly. Consistency in fresh air condition leads to uniformity in the incubation environment. Equipment must be maintained and in good operating condition to deal with the extreme weather conditions. Controlling the level of humidity is a key to success for controlling quality. And how you control temperature can change with the seasons. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, very nice, very nice presentation. As as usual, as what we expected. Um, let me fix my thing here. Okay, um, you can tell the years of experience you have. I'm not saying you're old. I'm just saying the years of experience <laughs> you have doing doing this type of stuff is is quite. I am old. <laughs> well, yeah, we're all getting that way. Um, but a uh, co couple of questions that came up in here. Um, Regarding some of our the older systems, the question was, they said you used to have a cold water misting system that provided humidity into the room. Is that still okay as a substitution? It is. Uh, you know, the thing about it, it's like we talked about or like we uh, observed with our, our latent and sensible heat chart. Uh, the thing about the cold water humidification in a room is the importance of being able to maintain humidity comes in the ability to have enough BTUs of heating to absorb that water. So we oftentimes find uh, a lot of older hatcheries with undersized ventilation, and that becomes a downfall. You don't have that. You, you can put all the water you want to in, in the room, uh, spraying it in there. You just don't have the ability to absorb it because you don't have the BTU capacity. So they have to work in combination to, to you know, to provide you with uh, an accurate system. Effective humidity, when we talk about applying water to a room, you know, the probably the, the most popular system today is a high pressure atomizing system. The reason that is probably more effective is because the high pressure forces the water through a nozzle and it produces a very fine micro droplet. It's actually like a 0.5 micron droplet size. So it's, it's lighter than air uh, and you have surface area. So the more surface area you have, the quicker absorption rate that you have. Again, you still have to have the BTU capacity to absorb it, but that's, that's the most popular and effective system uh, you know, on the market today, as far as just putting water into the air. Yeah. Um, in relation to um, increasing energy costs, and this is something that we see, um, what's your, your thoughts on having your fresh air plums connected to the units instead of trying to condition a complete incubator or hatcher rooms? Well, so um, with, and that's one of the advantages that comes with, with an air handling or a system is because you have modulating control over the supply air that's being fed to, to your incubation equipment. And if you're able to, to control that temperature 
uh, very defined, which most of those systems, our systems do, um, it's going to be always within a, a one or two degrees of, you know, generally a half a degree of the set point. So having that ducted directly to uh, the incubation equipment is, is really um, absolutely nothing wrong with, with having that type of a system. You've got to have an air handling system, good controls in order to do that, though. But as far as far as the differences in energy costs in relation to the effectiveness of them, no the the thing you gotta the thing you gotta recognize is that it, there's two pieces to that the volume of outside air that's brought into a room ultimately is just in the name of providing the incubator or hatcher with the required amount of air that it needs. It doesn't matter if this, if you put 10 incubators in a gymnasium, or if you put them in a real small confined room, uh, or if you duct that air directly into the machine, at the end of the day, it's all still the same volume of airflow. The big difference being when it's supplied directly into a room, we have that opportunity for doors to be left open and excessive volumes of outside air brought in just to try to satisfy pressure when it can't. So there are big energy losses uh, associated just simply around that function alone. Okay. Probably in the name of 15 to 20 percent more efficient if you ducted it directly to machines versus letting a, a dumping it into a room where doors are going to be open several times a, a day, several times a week. Yeah. So, there, so there is some, that, yeah, there are some concerns with that. Okay. Um, in relation to the psychometric chart you talked about, is it is it necessary because you you have both dry bulb, wet bulb, all that stuff? Is that more of an example, or are you saying that that hatchery manager personnel should be measuring both wet bulb and dry bulb both or is that more of an example that whole chart that the whole chart is more of an example but i mean it's yeah. real world uh, you know we're looking at real uh, average high humidity and high heat conditions yeah. and low temp and 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 the set point for a room that is is fairly average you know 78 degrees and 50 percent relative so it it's just, it was used as an example to understand how hard it is to manage humidity because extreme heat and high humidity, we have to remove a lot of water. Uh, extreme cold temperatures, even if it's raining outside, you bring that into the building and warm it up, you still have to add a lot of moisture back into the, you know, to the room or to the supplied air prior to introducing it to the, to the incubation equipment. So that's what that chart was really intended for, is to, to grasp a full understanding yeah. of, of how critical humidity can be. More of an understanding rather than they need to measure all these things. Yeah, but, yeah, it's not. Yeah, that'd be asking quite a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> Make your own psychometric chart by taking your own measurements. <laughs> that's right. Um, okay, so if you've got water in your pressure tubing, I mean, how's the best way to get it? Just blowing it out, the high pressure air, blowing it out, is that the best way to clean it out or does that do the job? Yeah, so the, the most important thing to remember is that your pressure sensing devices built into your room controls are generally nothing more than a small diaphragm and they're very sensitive, especially to high pressure. And so what you have to be careful with is normally I try to start at a room controller and unhook the tubing and then either apply a low pressure. Uh, a lot of times I'll just blow on it if it's not something that's that's too far away uh, and make sure you're only applying pressure from from the control out to an empty box, you know, your reference box that's either in a plenum or or something along those lines. And I say that because when you look at your outside air reference, you may have multiple controllers connected to that same outside air reference. And if you only unhook it from one and you apply pressure, you can damage the diaphragms in your pressure sensors in the other controls. So you've got to unhook all of those in order to accomplish that, that task. But yeah, you, you can generally just blow in it or yeah, you can have a small compressor set like at five or, or 10 PSI and, and that'll generally clear it. Um, so if the air, if the air is already filtered, the, the air that is already filtered is less than 45% humidity. 
how do you compensate for the humidity in dry regions? I mean, what are, what are some things they can do in that hatchery to compensate? I mean, that could go both ways. So if you're in a really, like you said, a really dry region or a really humid region, I mean, what, what are, in your opinion, the best ways to compensate for that? Is it always just set points in your, in your hallways or do you start getting in your incubators and changing settings or what's your thoughts? Well, obviously your first goal is to satisfy the machine with a required amount of humidity. And so what we're saying, I'm assuming the question is referring to if we don't have that opportunity, if we cannot add enough humidity into a room to avoid the dry, the dry condition, then yes, um, you've got to manage your incubators. You know, you've got to, you've got to put less stress on it. You know, take a, take a James Way tunnel ventilated, you know, incubator is a perfect example of that. If I put that incubator in a very dry climate uh, and I have a room that's consistently 45% relative to supply that machine, if I, if I don't lower the wet bulb on that incubator down to probably 80 or 82, it's going to spray so much to satisfy the wet bulb internally in the machine that our dampers will be at minimum. Uh, we won't have good air exchange. We won't provide enough oxygen. We'll have high CO2 and we'll have overcooling in the incubator. And eventually, if I have that, if I have that last long enough, um, we're going to have to start setting eggs a lot earlier because of the cool incubation environment. We we're going to we're going to slow down our incubation process. So you have to manage that wet bulb in the machine in order to to try to get through that that dry condition without over uh you know causing too high of a moisture loss uh from your egg itself so it's a combination you've got to lower the wet bulb but you can't take it so low that that you're overextending your moisture loss what about in, in countries, and I've been to a few, I'm sure you've been to a few where they're not really using a lot of ventilation systems, you know, they've got more, maybe a, a, a somewhat of an acceptable, acceptable air supply. What, what are your thoughts on that where they're really not using typical ventilation system? Yeah, so, in, and we see that a lot in hatcheries in, in Central Americas, uh, in the Caribbeans, you know, where uh, atmospheric conditions are never extremely cold or extremely hot, but there's always a certain level of humidity uh, and they don't have a ventilation system that's going to, to try to precondition the air or change the condition of the air prior to, to entering the incubation equipment. In most of those cases, we see higher than desired humidity levels. And in, in that particular case, um, you can be in a situation where you just consistently have high humidity in your incubation. And you have to try to, to have a higher rate of air exchange through the machine in order to um, have adequate moisture loss. And that's really what it boils down to. You've, you've got to try to get it more air through the machine if you're consistently you know, higher in humidity. Okay. What do you see any any issues with um, you know uh, labor sh labor shortages or challenges in the U.S. and I find it in many other places and how that might affect a ventilation in hatcheries? I mean, is it you seeing that tied together at all? I was in a hatchery the other day, and both maintenance guys, one of them was running the separator, and the other one was stacking <laughs> hatchery bits up at the end of the tray wash. So, so there you go, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and and in the meantime, you know, I I go on the roof and I find. Uh, multiple air handling units where the fresh outside air supply was uh, not working correctly and, and room pressures were all over the place and, and stages of heating weren't uh, functioning correctly, just a lack of maintenance on ventilation. And, and where were the maintenance guys? So yeah, the lack of labor availability has, has caused that and has affected ventilation heavily. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could see that that affects that affects everywhere, especially when you start seeing the breeder manager in there working. And the, <laughs> it's not only affects your ventilation, affects the whole operation. That's right. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, then your fertility starts suffering because your breeder manager is driving your chick delivery truck. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. We do see that for sure. Yeah. Um, one comment I'm going to make, because we have several different comments on here asking how they can get a copy of, of the presentation. Very popular chat. A lot of people have been asking for it. Um, you will, everybody will get to, um, in the next day or two an email um, from James Way with a link to watch this video presentation. And at that time, you can then request when you get the email, you can re request a copy of the PDF of the presentation as well. Um, so instead of answering everybody independently on that, I'm just going to say that out there. So you, you all do have an opportunity to get that. You just have to request it um, from our, our people. So um, anyway, several other questions around here are, are pretty specific for specific um, situations and i'm thinking of myself well, i was try to answer it i'd want to ask a whole bunch of questions first before i could answer it appropriately so we'll kind of wait on those and if we didn't get to your question then um chad can respond to you by email we'll have some of the unanswered questions and he can respond to email because there might be some follow-up that needs to be had in that so anyway very good very good comments um and, and some questions i can tell is a very good topic and you covered it covered it very well so thank you chad and uh, thank you all for, for uh, joining us, participating with us, and look forward to seeing future webinars. We'll have another one coming up. Um, next scheduled one is February. Just we'll, we'll let people know, though, if we have special requests or events that we do. But um, um, we'll be um, glad to see you at a future webinar. And thank you again, Chad, for your help. And thank you, Mauricio, um, from the Spanish translation side for um, helping us here. And look forward to seeing you all later. Have a have a good day, week, whatever. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.